Good morning, everyone. I hope that you're all having a good morning. So um, as Councillor Chancel mentioned, my name is Giselle General. I'm a volunteer for five years now with the Edmonton Transit Service Advisory Board. And I was elected chair last year and basically the only person who had volunteered pre-COVID. So it's a really interesting um, experience amongst my fellow volunteers. Um, when we went to the CUDA, so the uh, Canadian Urban Transit Association Conference in November 2019, that's when I realized how unique this concept is. Like the city having a, a, some kind of a system where volunteers can have a you know, structured system, meet every month, do research and present in front of council. Uh, during the conference, people are trying to sell me their transit products. And I'm like, I don't work for the city. I'm a volunteer of this volunteer-based, citizens-based uh, advisory board. So we have about, at this point, uh, 10 members. Usually we have spots up to 12. And just like every other agencies that the city tries to call, so agencies, boards, and commissions, these are volunteer-based. People apply and uh, share their time, about 10 to 15 hours a month, which I think is incredible. And we have discussions. A lot of the times we have uh, city employees that help us with the administration of the board and an opportunity to directly ask people questions, including Edmonton Transit Administration. And uh, we learn also from guests and presenters. And what we try is to present to city council in an organized way, you know, reports and presentations, perspectives of everyday transit users so that they can have that as additional material when they make decisions on budgeting, policies and programs, or just understand how it's like for a bunch of people who use transit every day um, so that they can uh, make good decisions at least that's our goal. We meet once a month, every last Monday of the month, virtually. And now because our meetings are virtual, you can log in online and watch us live. And every January, just like any of the other boards and committees that the city has, you can apply to volunteer. So I uh, think from my perspective, I've been here five years, it's a different and a rewarding goal. Uh, it's a way for me to make an impact in the community in a big picture way. And I have seen examples of that over the years. So just like that's a bit of an overview about the Edmonton Trans Advisory Board. Um, we are very um, searchable. We have a dedicated web page on the City of Edmonton website. And there's the email for the chair. So you can uh, contact that email and it will uh, go to me. And we can uh, talk a little bit more about how you want to participate or attend or present. And we will be always happy to, uh, to have you there. So my uh, task this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce the BTS branch manager, Carrie Horton McDonald. Through my role as the chair of the Edmonton Transit Advisory Board, we collaborated and work on uh, many locations, even including pre COVID. So I have some uh, experience of uh, interacting with her and understanding her uh, transit background. So she's um, been car, she has been experienced in being car crew for 12 years, which I think is really valuable when. Um, managed the uh, uh, transit system like BTS, and she had many, many decades of experience working on different transit agencies, which I think is really useful. Um, I'm sure you all know that the transit routes to the bus network we designed had changed since uh, 2021, and she said her favorites are the express and cross town routes, I use those too, and she really likes the 900X, and her whole and dream for the future of transit is to make sure that it is uh, fast, safe, reliable, and accessible, and to help people move away from thinking of transit as primarily a peak service. She's, possibly, she's really passionate about the humble or the regular bus and its critical role in moving people around the city. So for today, she will be having a presentation, and after that, I will help the audience along um, during our during the session. But for now, let's welcome to the stage, Carrie Horton McDonald. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Jiza, for that introduction. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me and including me today. Uh, and thanks to you today as well for hosting us. Uh, great venue. I'm happy to be here uh, with everyone. So I've been working with ETS and with the city for six years. And two years ago, uh, right at you know the peak of the COVID uh, international pandemic, I took the helm uh, with ETS uh, when ridership was at its lowest levels that we had ever seen. Uh, I'm actually the first woman to lead ETS in our hundred plus year history, uh, which I think is both. that it has taken that long uh, to recognize that maybe this is something that a woman can also do. Um, I live in Edmonton. I'm multimodal. Uh, I use transit regularly. I love my bike. I walk a lot. And much to the admiration of my eight-year-old that we had on an e-scooter last year, uh, <laughs> so if you saw me through the River Valley with, with my son, uh, we were having lots of fun checking out the, the ride shares. Uh, and I also drive a car occasionally as well. I'm really, really passionate about transit. I'm passionate about transit's role and what it can do for equity, inclusivity in our cities, livability, and creating healthy, climate-resilient uh, cities that we can all enjoy. Today is special not just because it is a community event, but also because it's National Transit Operator and Transit Worker Appreciation Day. And I am thrilled to have some colleagues here uh, in the room, and if you don't mind, I'd like to give them a nice warm kind of round of applause for everything they do. So I've had a bit of a heavy heart with so many other people this week, and it really got me reflecting on the work that public servants do in our city, and thinking specifically about Edmontonians working on the front lines. And, you know, I think of the thousands who deliver public services, including transit. So most of our employees, just to give you a quick snapshot, they're working shifts. And some of them are pulling out of our garages at 3.30 in the morning to make sure that people can get to where they need to go. And while they're doing that, the previous day's service is coming into the garage. So we're around the clock uh, 365 days a year. Most of our employees, don't get to work from home when the weather is terrible because they're busy transporting us around the city. They aren't sitting in front of computers or at desks. And in minus 50 degree temperatures, in extreme cold, they're sometimes outside, repairing our cracked rails so that the trains can be the point of service. They work as instructors, maintenance staff, track crew, inspectors, analysts, planners, or dispatchers, just to name a few. Some are just starting their careers, some are retiring after an incredible 45 years of service, and some choose transit as their second and fourth career. They face ever-changing hazards on the job, including things we honestly never even contemplated five years ago. They enable mobility in our city, and they make sure our kids can get to and from school, that seniors can get to medical appointments, or that after a long day at work, we can all get home to our families. I have 2,300 coworkers at ETS, and I'm going to be forever grateful for this opportunity to serve alongside them. I'd also like to thank our union partners, such as ATU, and I know they're here today, as well as CSU and IBEW for their great work in supporting our employees. And lastly, I'd like to thank Steve Bradshaw, president of ATU. We meet weekly for our very early morning uh, coffee chats, and just really appreciate and look forward to those discussions for the week. So in addition to working with our direct employees, we have a lot of other formal partnerships involved in public transit in Edmonton. So it includes most of the areas of city administration in the city of Edmonton. So I thought it'd be important because a lot of times people think transit in Edmonton, ETS, but I actually have a lot of different partners involved in different aspects of uh, public transit work. So I'd like to go through a few examples. We have a branch planning and environment services that creates the long-term transit plan and they lead our climate-related strategies for the city. So the mass transit plan for a city of 1.25 million residents, and we'll talk about lots today, is the longer-term plan uh, approved last winter by council that sets out some really cool milestones for us that we need to reach 
in order to support our city plan. Infrastructure planning and design, and then infrastructure delivery services, they work with us for things like when we need new transit garages as we work to expand our service. We have a whole branch focused on LRT expansion and renewal activity, so all of the growth in LRT that I'll reference uh, in the presentation is led by that branch. Community standards and neighborhoods, they need our transit peace officers and they take care of all of our bylaw enforcement activities. Social development <laughs> is our community outreach transit team. Uh, they support us by coordinating our direct poison and prevention team outreach plan and they lead the extreme weather uh, planning process. Parks and road services leads implementation of the shared micromobility plan for e-bike and e-scooters in the city. They maintain the active transportation network once it's built, and they're responsible for snow and ice and maintain roadways, sidewalks, and pathways. And last but not least, as another example, fleet and facility services, they oversee our transit bus maintenance service, commissioning and maintenance of all of our buses, and provide cleaning and maintenance in our transit facilities. So before getting into the nitty gritty of how we deliver service, I wanted to talk a little bit about outcomes and what it means to have public transit in our cities. To be honest, I could probably do a whole presentation just about public transit outcomes, but I'll keep it brief. When I think about transit and research has shown, it's connected to making our city more inclusive and reduces social isolation. Being a critical lever for reducing poverty and it connects people to training as well as employment. It creates positive economic outcomes by both creating jobs and supporting job growth in the entire region. It also generates positive health outcomes and connects people to healthcare, recreation, as well as social opportunities. And probably most important in my mind, public transit is climate action. So how are we structured uh, with ETS service? So there's four buckets of work. We have conventional bus service, the humble bus that we see out in the streets uh, delivering uh, people to their destinations. We have light rail transit. We have our on-demand transit. And they work together as part of our conventional transit network. And then we have paratransit service, which is providing specialized transit support under our brand DATS. We've heard loud and clear that there are clear attributes essential for helping people to choose transit. That includes making sure it's convenient, making sure it's reliable, making sure it's safe, accessible, and inclusive. We recently achieved a milestone, recovering bus ridership in both January and February to our pre-pandemic levels. We were one of the first large cities in Canada to get there. For context, this time last year, we had between 750 and 850 board 1,000 boardings per week. Uh, the same weeks this year, we're at between 1.2 and 1.3 million boardings per week. And that's great growth year over year. So I want to thank our riders for that. So I'd like to share a few highlights of ETS as a branch. <clears throat> our budget is comprised of two parts, expenses and revenues. So this is our operating budget. So expenses for 2023 total 429.5 million, and about 90% of the budget is to cover staff, service contracts, electricity, and fuel. I know it's very thrilling and very exciting expenditures. Uh, we partially offset those costs with revenues from things like transit advertising, so you can see advertising in our spaces or on our buses and trains, as well as our fares. That leaves us with about 285.5 million dollars in funding from the municipal tax levy. We have one of the lower cost per ride figures in Canada for medium and large systems with about $3.81 per ride. And fun fact, we've driven enough kilometers in service to go around the world 1,115 times in the last year. We have in clean our DAT service and conventional service over a thousand buses in our fleet. Um, we have 60 battery electric buses, and we're also pilot testing a hydrogen fuel cell electric bus. We've been improving frequencies, including off-peak, and we're one of five cities with a high-frequency bus corridor uh, in our network. We've been operating full service levels for most of the pandemic, including the last year. We're the first in Canada to offer regional fare capping with our regional ARC implementation, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. And we're connecting more people to the network by having the largest on-demand transit program uh, in the country. 
So a little bit more about our budget. Wanted to explain and show you how we are funded uh, for our operations. So as I mentioned, we're primarily funded through the municipal tax levy and revenues. We have a small grant from the provincial government for our low-income transit pass program. In 2021 and 2022, we were very grateful. Uh, all transit properties in Alberta uh, received safe restart funding from both the federal and provincial governments to address revenue shortfalls due to lower ridership because of the international pandemic. This was one-time funding on two occasions, and it's not ongoing support. So while we do receive some funding support for capital projects like L2 expansion or art implementation, we don't receive ongoing operational funding from our revenue partners. So another component of funding in our operating budget is looking at how we provide service in a growing city. And I don't think it would come as a surprise to anyone that we have regular population growth uh, in the city. So when we don't keep up with our transit investments, particularly for bus service, and that's what I wanted to highlight today, we struggle to maintain service levels and plan accordingly. So we're in the middle of doing some analysis, looking at our service hours uh, for bus service per capita. So since 2015, the amount of service we provide really hasn't kept pace with population growth in the city. So as we work on the operational implementation of the mass transit plan, we're recognizing that we have to grow service for the population horizon, but we also need to catch up and address current gaps in the bus network. And for those of us using bus service, I think we can all acknowledge there are some gaps and we have some work to do. And we're not uh, oblivious to that by any means. So in order to talk about bus service, I need to talk about our facilities and talk about our capacities for growing. We have six garages in the city that support transit operations and maintenance. We have our Dion McDonald facility, which houses all of our high floor LRT service for capital and metro lines. We have our bus garages, so Farrier, Centennial, Mitchell, and Kathleen Andrews. And on this slide, you can see a picture of Kathleen Andrews. She is the first woman transit operator to have worked with ETS, and she inspires us every single day. And I'm thrilled that our, um, the garage that replaced uh, the Aging Westwood garage is named after her. And then we have our Percy Wickman uh, facility for all of our data service. Two garages support our in depot overhead battery electric charging infrastructure. Kathleen Andrews is one of them, and Centennial is the other. And then we have another garage that's going to support our hydrogen fuel cell uh, electric buses. So we are fully tapped out for storing buses in our facilities, and we don't really have room to store any additional buses. So we're navigating what comes next in order to facilitate the growth that we need, including a new garage plan and federal funding. And we're looking at smaller opportunities to repurpose existing city facilities. So how are transit decisions made? For many, many years before I got into transit, I always wondered like, how the heck do they decide where these routes are going? How do they decide what my fare is gonna be? How do they decide who gets service, who doesn't get service? At a high level, council sets the framework for our decision making. So we're a service within the city of Edmonton. Council is our governance or governor layer. Um, they approve our transit policies, we have two of them, and we have bylaws and budget that are set every four years. The transit service policy identifies the principles to guide service-related decisions and has service standards that give us the detailed technical specifications to inform all of the service decisions. They were developed with input from Edmontonians and improved in 2019. So Council also sets the overall strategic direction for the city, including transit, by, approve, by approving, as an example, our city plan, and then any transit-related growth plans and corresponding strategies. Our city manager reports to Council and oversees all of city administration, so all, uh, however many thousand employees are in the city, and the 70 plus different services that we provide. So that position delegates authorities to deputy city managers and branches like ETS. Branches have leadership teams that have certain decision-making authorities related to things like spending our budgets, managing contracts, delivering service, occupational health and safety, and managing our staff. We do formal public engagement and research throughout the year. 
and we lead additional engagement through gender-based analysis uh, plus processes in our work. We also do internal engagement through things like focus groups, pop-up sessions, and we do surveys as well. We bring reports forward to council, as I'm sure you all know and have seen, and I encourage you to participate if you can uh, participate in those meetings uh, to share your feedback. So we bring them forward for council's consideration, including uh, to motions that they've made or uh, bringing forward emerging items and opportunities. Using the transit service policy and service standards, our budget for service hours, performance data, rider and operator feedback, we do our transit planning through the network. Changes are made five times per year, and once we do our route planning, we develop corresponding schedules and then plans for the workforce, fleet, facilities, and the equipment. So I'm sorry if that was boring. It's very basic overview, <laughs> but I just feel like it's one of those questions that we often, uh, you know, are wondering about for jumping forward. So I want to talk a little bit about budget and what happened in December related to transit. For those of you that don't know, it was the four-year budget deliberations by City Council, uh, again for all 70-plus services in the city. So we do four-year business plans, four-year budgets, um, and that includes both operating and capital. I'll go through operating first, then I'll talk about capital. So going into the budget deliberations, we knew it was going to be, uh, in all likelihood, a very, very constrained budget due to things like, and I'm sure we all feel it ourselves, rising interest rates, uh, higher costs, price escalations, and then specific to the city, limited debt room, and we had some issues about uh, timing of large high cost projects, putting pressure on borrowing for capital. We also heard lots and lots of concerns, and I'm sure we all feel it, about maintaining affordability for Hamiltonians during the time, uh, or during this time of inflation. So council's budget decisions provided some really, really important funding for transit. And I guess we were so surprised and just so grateful for every single you know, dollar uh, that was directed to us. It's gonna make a huge difference for Edmontonians who rely on transit each week. So they made, as an example, on-demand transit service a permanent layer in our network. So up to that point, we were testing it. It had a great response, but we didn't have permanent funding. So that's now a permanent layer in the network. We also funded 500 daily off-peak service hours. And I'm so passionate about adding more off-peak service because of what it can do and achieve for equity uh, in our city. We're no longer just a peak-only service. People need transit around the clock. And I think those 500 weekly hours are a really important start uh, to, to making that change. And we increased the amount of on-demand transit service by 25%. So we're in the process of hiring the operators on the on-demand side, uh, procuring vehicles, to put those into service uh, this fall. They also froze uh, transit fare prices for two years and supported dropping the single trip fare in ARC to 275 uh, instead of 350. We also increased investments in safety and security and we added more washroom attendants for the public washroom <coughs> facilities and transit. And I'll talk about safety and security in a bit. I don't know if you heard about this thing called regional transit, it's what a half happen. <laughs> so the good news is, regional transit continues. <laughs> regional transit is not dead, uh, and I can attest to that, and I know I have some regional colleagues in the room as well. So I just want to explain a little bit about how everything shook out and what it means. So the proposed model around regional transit was to have the commission lead uh, regional transit service in the Edmonton metro region. Half of the 13 municipalities who had uh, supported exploring the model decided that they couldn't support it. So it doesn't mean that regional transit collaboration stops. Collaboration will be things long before the commission model was even contemplated, and it's going to continue. Transit service today exists in Fort Saskatchewan, Strathcona County, City of Leduc, Leduc County, Beaumont, Spruce Grove, Stony Point, St. Albert, Atchison, and Parkland County. There are shared regional investments, including our UPASS agreement, which I know a lot of you are familiar with, our regional fairing, so our ARC implementation, regional airport service, we have mass transit planning being done at a regional level, integrated trip planning, 
shared technology, access agreements, and we have regional service delivery. My transit colleagues and I in the region and our CAOs and city managers are just very committed. We're going to continue this collaboration and we're going to build on the success that we've had. So as a region, as I mentioned, we're working together um, to implement regional smart fare payment technology, uh, known as ARC. This is rolling out in phases. We have UPass students and our adult fare riders using the system, and then this year we're adding the youth uh, rider groups, seniors, as well as participants in any of our low-income transit pass programs. We'll also add our ARC validators to our paratransit fleet. We have several options for people to use ARC, including ARC vending machines, <coughs> getting a single-use ticket, or the option to go to the ARC card. And yes, you can use debit and credit finally uh, at those vending machines. We introduced regional fare capping. And what that means is when you hit your daily or monthly cap as a Manitobian um, and as a rider, you won't be paying anything more for the remainder of that period. So after all of these groups have transitioned, we then get a move, because I get asked about this a lot, to open payment, which essentially means you can use your smartphone, you can use a debit or a credit card uh, to tap the validator, validators as well uh, when you board the bus or when you're using an LRT. Wanted to give a quick overview of some of the transit fare supports that are provided as a result of our redesigned transit fare policy in 2019 and as a result of introducing ARC. So ARC, again, introduced regional fare capping. Uh, we're actually the first in Canada to offer regional fare capping. It helped us lower the per trip price to $2.75 if you use an ARC card. It introduces debit and credit options. We have a retail network, and there's no additional charges for missed apps, contrary to uh, some of the uh, perceptions out there. And overall, we have 30,000 different art cards in use in the region, which is fantastic. We have offerings through um, social agencies, so we do uh, fare free um, monthly passes for those uh, through our PATH program, so about 1,900 free monthly passes are distributed. Fare free seniors for seniors who are experiencing low income, and we also have a sliding scale um, model as well. <clears throat> Children 12 and under ride for free. And our youth monthly pass price decreased, and we're putting in another decrease in 2025. So, a few more slides. So, in terms of capital budget, capital budget uh, highlights included important investments in replacing our old uh, YouTube train cars. And believe it or not, these train cars were put into service in the 1970s and have never been replaced. Uh, once the current cars fail on them. We're not able to save for the half the service because they actually don't make those parts anymore. It's funny how that works. Um, so replacing those trains is going to take several years, uh, but it was really exciting to see that uh, commitment from council uh, to help us get those train cars replaced. We also have placeholder, placeholder funding for a new garage to support our growth and conversion of the fleet to lower emission vehicles. It's pending, pending funding from the federal government, and our application is being assessed by them right now uh, through the Zero Emission Transit Fund. We also got the green light to proceed with elements from the Mass Transit Plan, including planning and design for bus rapid transit and transit priority measures. And lastly, they also include funding for land acquisition uh, to support further LRT expansion. So there are key opportunities for us. Uh, as we work towards our mass transit plan, a few years ago we did research to convert the, lever the levers of transit ridership and presented it to council. They agreed that our internal levers are things that we directly have influence on, include things like improving service convenience, reliability, accessibility, safety, as well as fairing. And by fo focusing on these elements, we can impact mode share and grow our ridership. So I'm going to start talking about some of the elements uh, in that model. So as everybody knows, we implemented the bus network redesign in April 2021 after several years of engagement, design, and redesign, and tweaking. One of the questions I was asked to think about for today is, do I think the DNR worked? And I think it depends on how we uh, consider success. So it helped us modernize the network by introducing more direct routes, more frequent service, particularly in the core, and it reduced duplication. 
It provides more evening and weekend service and about 20% more service on Sundays. We had neighborhoods that had no service at all and uh, neighborhoods that were underserved uh, prior to introducing the revised network. It's one of the tools that has helped us recover ridership uh, on the bus side. There's different types of routes, as you know, to different types of travel needs. So we have frequent, frequent routes that provide 15 minute service or better. We have express routes that carry riders quickly between, as an example, the outer area of the city into the downtown. We tried to close some of the gaps associated with not meeting conventional uh, bus service standards by introducing on-demand transit. The new bus network used the same amount of budget, operators, and buses. We knew that it would need to continue to evolve and it's not going to be perfect. We committed to listening and learning from riders and staff, evaluating performance data, and continuing to adjust and evolve it. We made hundreds and hundreds of changes in response to that analysis, and we're going to keep doing that through each of the seven changes. So from a service perspective, we have some really great opportunities for our network, building on what we have today. So we know that service levels are a critical part in making it a convenient and reliable service. That includes span of service, frequencies, on-time performance. Those are all key focus areas for us. We do need to access additional facility capacity in order to grow the bus fleet and provide more service. Um, and we're pursuing those opportunities with council and having these conversations um, this year. We have learned that there's more demand for off-peak, as I mentioned, particularly to benefit equity seeking communities. And as soon as we get those operators hired, those additional weekly service hours are going to go into the, into the network. And our work around equity analysis of the network continues throughout the year as well. The Mass Transit Plan outlines a few network improvements, including, as I mentioned, bus rapid transit, transit priority measures uh, to help our buses move faster. So both of those components receive funding during the budget process. And we're just really excited to see it move forward. A little bit about on-demand transit. So it was, as I mentioned, added when we introduced the network redesign. It provides a transit option for those areas that don't meet service standards. It connects people to a transit hub uh, so that they can then connect to our uh, conventional transit service. It has grown. Uh, so we serve 52 neighborhoods and 19 seniors' residences. Ridership has continued to increase. So we had 5,500 rides in the first full month of service, and now it's well over 40,000 rides per month um, as of January 2023. Feedback from the community informed the design of it. We conducted gender-based analysis. We ensured we have accessible vehicles and child-friendly seats as examples. We've heard really powerful stories of how the service center has helped our communities. So stories like you know, a young rider sharing that on-demand has meant uh, better access, made transit a hundred times more convenient, led me to be happier and stress-free uh, as a 19-year-old in the city. It means independence and economic savings. It's been a great support for my family. It's allowed our to get to work in a timely manner without having a car and expanded job opportunities that were not possible uh, before on-demand service. So now, the elephant in the room, <laughs> safety and security. And I just, I, I want to acknowledge and just convey how incredibly difficult this situation is. It keeps me up and it keeps my coworkers up at night. Never ever would have predicted, even five years ago, that we'd be talking about the issues that we have to talk about. We are seeing this across North America. Uh, transit is at the intersection of very complex, um, I'll call them social issues, uh, happening in our, in our cities. So to start, I'll say it requires a lot of partnerships from all levels of government to get through this. And we have to talk about root causes. There are public health components, there's shelter and housing components, safety and security components, and service elements. In terms of the specific framework that we use to guide what we can do as transit on safety and security, it includes these six elements. There are multiple different examples of tactics within the elements that I tried to highlight, and it's just a guide to help us, you know, with the items that we have some direct influence over. 
We're in the process of adding more transit peace officers to the network. We're implementing in the next couple of weeks a bystander campaign. And we're working with our National Transit Association uh, to design up the training curriculum for our staff. In addition to needing support for these broader issues, we have to just keep focusing on seeking out partnerships. And I'll give a really simple example to illustrate what I mean by partnerships. We need support from our public telecommunications companies to add network infrastructure in our transit spaces so that you can have cellular access when you're in our LRT service. It's an issue, it's a simple issue, but it's an issue across the country. So it's, it's affecting riders in Toronto, it's affecting riders in Edmonton. We need better networks to allow everyone to have that access. <coughs> I've been trying to ask everyone around me to lead with compassion. And I know that's difficult as a rider when you're navigating these situations that are very uncomfortable and at times we feel unsafe. But having compassion for the transit staff that are navigating issues they've never encountered before. Compassion for the people that feel they have no other place to go and they're in our spaces because they feel like that's their best option is sitting on a cold concrete floor. Compassion for our riders who are just you know, navigating very difficult circumstances. And for all of the staff and contractors and partners who are trying to navigate, how do I get people the support they need? Where do they go? What options do they have? It's extremely challenging for all of us right now. We need to come together. I don't have all the answers, but I do know it's another example, and it really does illustrate the concept of it takes a village. It's not possible for one person to solve this, and I just, I really hope and I ask for your understanding and just know that we really do deeply care about all of you and everyone in those spaces. I'm sorry if that's a bit heavy, but I think it's important to put it up there. I wanna talk about our DATS service. So DATS is our paratransit service in Edmonton. I'm extremely proud of this service and the work that's done by this uh, group of transit workers. They offer door-to-door -door transit service for Edmontonians who cannot use, they cannot use regular transit easily for some or all of their travel needs due to a physical or cognitive impairment. So we have wheelchair lift equipped vehicles, minivans, accessible minivans, taxis, uh, and other vehicles used to provide that support. There was an action plan approved by council that we're working through uh, to really improve service in response to some of the feedback from DATS users. So it included things like addressing our operator workforce uh, shortages that we had at the time. Uh, we had uh, excess retirements and unplanned staff absences a few years ago. Pursuing technological enhancements and trip scheduling and real-time user information. Leveraging the fully accessible conventional fleet. Providing clients with an option to book either a pickup or drop off from there. And providing more flexibility to address individual client needs. I want to talk quickly about LRT expansion. We have a lot of expansion plans underway uh, from the city, including Capital Line, Metro Line, as well as Valley Line. So Valley Line is being delivered as a P3 partnership model, uh, whereas Capital Line and Metro Line is directly um, provided and operated by ETS. We're eagerly awaiting an update on service announcement. I'm sorry I don't have breaking news today. <laughs> I'm also waiting for an update <laughs> and announcement. I've seen them testing their trains. I'm um, like just waiting anxiously and really hopeful that it's going to happen soon. Uh, we have a bus route, Route 73, running in place of having the trains operating. So when that service is operational, the train service, um, that route isn't going to be running. We'll have a bit of overlap, but then it won't be running. So it's an opportunity for council, and I know they're considering it. They could redirect those temporary funds to be a permanent addition to the network and we could uh, reinvest it into the network to be a service. Two more slides. So <laughs> one other big opportunity for us is aligning with active transportation. So we can incorporate active transportation as a first kilometer, last kilometer solution and support better integration with transit. The bike plan outlines a few integration opportunities and I've highlighted them on the screen. A few examples of issues we're working on. 
the design of our bike racks. And I had a few people reach out and say, did you realize your bike racks that are on the buses don't take children's bikes? So I can't get my fat tire bike on there, and I can't get my e-bike on there. <laughs> so it's such a simple thing, but it really um, is an awesome opportunity for us to do some research and try and change that. We don't have secure bike storage lockers at all of our stations. So how can we do it in a way that people would use them? And what's the right design? And what's the right securement? What are the right locations? Uh, so we're actively working on that with the community. And we think there's opportunities to explore how to better integrate to support shared micro-mobility programs as well. And one of the things I'm really proud of our team for, uh, within the first year of me being in this role, we made the decision that bikes are allowed any time of day, every day of the week, on our LRT. And I just want to say thank you. One of the things to all of you that um, have been doing that in a way that has caused zero issues. It's been very smooth. It's been a welcome uh, kind of change uh, to the network. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Transit, I hope you agree with me, is an essential service. And I honestly think the humble bus is integral to our network. I think that transit is at the heart of our cities. I'll end with a, a simple short little request, and I want to share a story about one of my favorite transit moments. So last summer, I had a long day at work. It was a very hot day. And I caught a late bus, so I missed my bus, which happens. Um, so I missed the bus, I hopped on, I was tired, I realized I was gonna miss my son's soccer game, and I was just in a really crummy mood. So I was kind of sitting there feeling miserable, and then I thought, okay, I need to like cheer up. This isn't the end of the world. I have a lot of privilege, it'll be okay. So I started like, paying close attention to my surroundings and the people that were on the bus. And then I noticed something that was really, really great. One by one, every single person as they disembarked said, thank you, thanks so much, have a great day, thanks so much. And watching our operator just nod and smile, and I know they hear it a lot, but my request is, please keep doing that. It means the world to us. Just to show our operators that appreciation, it really does make a difference, and I just encourage you uh, when you can, to keep doing that. I think it's a really positive way to kind of let our staff know uh, that we appreciate everything they're doing. And with that, I would just say thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.